Okay. Working? Okay, so guys, everyone, we begin lecture. This is lecture number five at Principles of Management. And today, yesterday, we finished with chapter number through two. Now we begin chapter number three from the same textbook. It is called Integrative Managerial Issues. And I'll be covering today over the course of lectures five and six, I'll be covering uh, this chapter. Chapter has a, a number of goals. Number one is, again, explain more about globalization. Globalization is becoming more and more and more important, especially in Southeast Asia and especially in Europe. For us, Europe, it's the European Union. For you guys here in Asia, it's what you call ASEAN or ASEAN, right? Which is the 10 Southeast uh, Asian uh, economies plus Japan and Korea and so on, okay? So globalization is becoming more and more important. Next, number one is discuss society's expectations in other words, when you open a business, society, the country, the government, the people, the locals who live in an area, they have certain expectations from business. Expectations like keep the environment clean, expectations like create good jobs, and so on. We're going to discuss some of these. The next continued number three is the factors which lead to ethical and unethical behavior. Unethical behavior will be, for example, uh, certain manufacturing, doing a lot of toxic type of work, and then polluting the environment, okay? And soon enough, polluting the water resource and then people drinking the water and getting sick okay this is happening very 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 often now in the United States it's happening quite often in the United Kingdom around Europe but it's happening very often in China okay happening in China very often maybe happening in here I'm not quite familiar okay and another important is describe how the workforce is changing and the impact it has on organization so we are having a number of little topics to discuss today we begin with the topic of globalization I already spoke a lot about it yeah, they always like to put in textbooks happy smiling faces, right? Uh, there's got to be a couple of guys, there's got to be an Asian one, there's got to be a European one. What they're missing in here, a black person, right? Well, they will have in the American edition of the textbook, they'll have one, okay? But this textbook is the Asian edition, okay? This textbook is sold in Asia, so they have a lot of Asian people with some European people, okay? That's very common. This in business is called product customization, okay? Product customization is part of globalization. In a globalized world, you're not going to sell exactly the same product in the United States and in Thailand, okay? The product has to be a little bit more appealing, okay? So, in the United States, the textbook will have the same picture with a black man here or a black smiling girl here, okay? You understand that part? In America, diversity is very important. Treating minorities is very important. So the original textbook will have a black boy or a black girl smiling 
and presenting all oh, we are part of the workforce the labor force here now because this textbook that we are looking at right now is designed for Asia instead of having a black person we'll have an Asian girl and boys smiling together with a European we call this in English Caucasian okay Caucasian is same as white man or woman okay so this globalization means that sometimes the product has to be a little different okay for example in one culture having the color of black is okay no problem but in another culture and in, a, in another country black color not okay meaning for an iphone or for some other product okay so in the world of globalization you will sometimes have to change the product just a little, okay? For example, you have, I'm just making up an example, black tea, okay? Black tea, you all drink tea, right? And you have black tea. Well, they don't put a black label in most markets. But for a particular market in a particular country associated with a particular culture, people associate black with death and they don't like to see the black label or if they see the black label they don't buy the product okay so there the product will be gray with a gray color okay so in a different country different culture or different religion different mentality you will have a slightly different product so this is part of globalization you cannot try to sell exactly the same product to Arabs and Hindus and Christians and Europeans and Africans and Southeast Asians okay and Russians okay people are different they think differently behave differently have different preferences okay and this is one example of this picture how the publisher McGraw Hill makes a little bit of a change of the product they're not going to change the whole textbook but they're going to change the smiling black girl with a smiling Asian girl okay that's an example of globalization so the globalization products sometimes change a little bit, okay? Another example of globalization, which I am discovering here, which I'm discovering here is, you guys don't ride big motorcycle, like Harley Davidson, right? Well, right, means you don't see very often Harley Davidson. When I was working and living in the United States, I had a big 800 cubic centimeter cruiser. It was a Suzuki Marauder. It's a big motorcycle with a, you know, wheel like that. It's called a cruiser. Well, there are no 800 motorbikes in here, 800 cc, right? There are few or any 600. Difficult to find even 450, right? It's even difficult to find 250, right? Very, very few of them. And those that you have are extremely expensive, okay? Well, they are extremely expensive because the government has a very, very big tax or an import tariff for big motorcycles, okay? So if they have a big tariff for big motorcycles, People choose the small motorcycle, which is a lot cheaper, okay? So, what you may have is two things. Culture of people driving demand. But it could be the other way around. Government policy with big tariffs driving culture. So, if government says big tax on big motorcycle, people just choose small motorcycle okay 
Same example and same explanation is in Europe. In Europe, Europeans drive small, little, efficient cars, okay? Usually diesel engine, okay? Well, it turns out that there is a government, there is a government regulation which has a huge tax on cars with engine size above 1.8 liter engine, which is 1800 cc, okay? Huge tax, okay? Now they increase the to up to two liter. So in Europe, you're not gonna see big engines like three liter, sometimes, but not very often. Four liter, five liter, no. In America, you have a lot of cars like these, okay? Not in Europe, okay? I mean, everybody likes to drive a big car, right? I mean, I see right across from the window here, you guys come with the big SUVs, right? And the big cars, right? Everyone's like to have a nice new big car. But sometimes government policy changes consumer behavior, okay? And when Americans try to sell American cars in Bulgaria or in Europe with these big engines, people don't buy them, okay? They're way too expensive, okay? So this is part of globalization too. Part of globalization is you need, as a manager, as a businessman, to understand the local market, the local government regulations, and very important, the local consumer demand, which could be different from a different country, okay? You cannot assume, because a product sells very well in China, that the same product will sell well in Thailand. No, you cannot do that. Same thing, you cannot assume a product sells really well in Hong Kong, the same product will sell well here. What the opposite? Because a product sells well here, it doesn't mean it will sell well in China or in Hong Kong or in Europe, okay? So, globalization is one thing, but you need to understand there is regionalizations where the global market is still segmented into country by country or region by region or culture by culture or government regulations could be very different. Okay, now discussion is global organizations and you know these global organizations you have a lot of different well, varieties. The one name that you're all right now using, most of you in class today, a global organization is Apple. You all use Apple computers. Oh, actually, Apple uh, tablets, the iPad, okay? Well, many of you use Apple iPhones. It's a global organization, global business. And you got a lot of different types, which I'll be explaining in the next few minutes. Another example of a global business, of course, these are all brand names or companies which you are perfectly familiar with. This is a Samsung, okay? In my particular case, I'm using a Samsung Galaxy, okay? And <coughs> it's a global company. It sells equally well in China as in Hong Kong, as in Macau, as in Europe, not in the United States. Why Samsung Galaxy Nexus cannot or does not sell in the United States? That's a tough one. I don't expect anyone to know the answer. The answer is because the, uh, the American government says you cannot sell it here. Why would they do that? Why would the American government intervene and say, illegal to sell in America? The answer is that this little piece of equipment is way better than the iPhone. As soon as it's put right next to the iPhone, 
this one sells, the iPhone doesn't sell. Cool. But now the question is, why works in Hong Kong doesn't work in the US? Why works in Hong Kong doesn't work in the US? The answer is, Apple is an American company. The American government is trying hard to protect the American company up against the competition. So Samsung Galaxy, particularly the first model Nexus, is a killer that will, could instantly kill iPhone on the American market. And therefore, they make up a law case where the judge says, oh, Galaxy is infringing on a patent of iPhone, and therefore, it is illegal to sell in the United States. So, in a world of globalization, you have governments that can respond with a protective type of measure, okay? Where they want to protect their own production up against the competition, okay? Now, you guys, I can see on the local roads, I mean, I just walk the streets or not right here with my little scooter, right? I can see you guys all drive to Yotas, right? For a car. You all drive to Yota, right? Everybody, almost everyone, will be driving to Yota. Yota is the most common car here, okay? Well, not in Europe. Why? You guys drive Toyotas and we don't drive Toyotas in Europe. I mean, is it that you guys are smarter choosing Toyotas and we are dumber and don't buy Toyota, okay? Is that the problem? Or the other way around? We drive instead BMWs. Are we smarter to drive a BMW or you dumber to drive Toyota? Right? And the answer is no. Neither you're smarter or dumber, nor we are. It is, again, government policy. European Union says for all Japanese cars, we put a big tax. The tax comes in the form of a tariff. When you import a Japanese car in Europe, the Japanese car, they put in 15%, maybe 10, maybe 20% tariff. The Japanese Toyota, which is, let's say, 20% cheaper than BMW, when you put the tariff, becomes as expensive as a BMW, okay? So I got a choice. I buy for the same price Toyota, or I buy for the same price BMW. What do I do as a consumer? I buy BMW. Okay? And I drive me about it. You understand? It's not about dumb or stupid, informed or uninformed. It is about government policy changing demand, usually by changing the price. Okay? It makes one product a lot more expensive, and it makes the competing product a lot more attractive. Okay? So, in a globalized world, you will have, and as a manager, you must be, must be very careful how government policy changes the overall outcome. Where you will see in Europe, everywhere, especially in my home country, Bulgaria, which is just as economically developed as Thailand. Not much better, not much worse. You see everywhere on the road, Lots of Mercedes, lots of BMW, and I don't see, you know, very few Toyotas, very few Hondas, okay? It's not that the Japanese car is bad, it's just government policy is moving our demand towards our own European production, okay? Bulgaria is inside the European Union. We don't have Within the European Union, all German cars come to Bulgaria, no tariff, no taxes, no nothing special, okay? So, that's very important. So what do globalization or global 
organization, global businesses do. They exchange goods and services with consumers. It basically means that they export their goods to other countries, or they can also import them. So global organizations do export and import. Export means producing the country, sorry, the good at home and selling it abroad. An example of an export is when I was one year ago to Macau, I wanted to buy me a nice camera. It's a Nikon D3100, it's called a DSLR camera, a very good one, very good pictures, very high quality, very reputable. So I buy the camera, take the pictures, everything, I'm looking at the back, it says made in Thailand, all right? You guys make it here, okay? I'm looking at the, uh, it's called the lens. The lens is detachable. Oh, made it Thailand. So, Japan, we say, has outsourced production of Nikon. Sometimes you pronounce Nikon, that's the American, or Nikon. You know Nikon, right? Nikon in American is Nikon, okay? So, you, uh, the Japanese have outsourced production over there. It is made here in Thailand and then it is shipped. It is sold in Bulgaria, it is sold in Hong Kong, in Macau and all over the world. Okay? So this is an example of where a Japanese company outsources production to Thailand or Vietnam or some other country and then it is exported to a third country like Hong Kong, Macau, or Germany. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is exchanging services or export of a service. Export of a service can go in two different ways. Now, the way I'm reading and I'm educating myself about the Thai economy, one export service here is healthcare. As in, people coming from a foreign country, they get a particular job, meaning healthcare job in here, a particular operation, okay? And then they go back in their home country, okay? Because in their home country, maybe Japan, maybe Korea, maybe UK, maybe US, or some other country, that particular surgery or job is so expensive that it's much cheaper to fly here, get the medical service here, okay? Someone's got a knee problem, okay? And a knee operation could easily cost $20,000, okay? Somewhere in Europe, okay? Or another country. And they say, hey, I can fly to Thailand. I can live there for 10 days. And I can get my surgery done. And the whole thing, the surgery is gonna cost me $5,000. Flight and vacation and everything else is going to cost me another $5,000. And I can get the whole thing done in with $10,000, okay, which is twice cheaper and get the vacation, right, than do it back home, okay. And I can get from home a medical vacation, right, a medical uh, leave to get me a vacation in Thailand, okay. So the idea is, hey, it's twice cheaper, it's better. So you can have the export of a service. And sometimes the person can go and do the job abroad, or the service could be delivered to the foreigner over here. Another type of a service will be real estate broker, where a British man has got a lot of money, he wants to buy a tiny, or oh, well, a nice good villa that's going to cost, I don't know, one million US dollars. It's going to cost 20, 30, 40 million baht, okay, right here on the beach. And the brokerage will says, okay, we're going to find you a villa, everything, we're going to do everything for you, paperwork, all the work, and it's going to cost you, let's say, 300,000 baht, or five, half a million baht, okay, for the service of brokering the purchase of a 
So, it could be exchange of good, it could be exchange of service. Next, they are employing managers, okay? Managers could be foreigners in a foreign country, okay? They will have managers working from different countries, from different nationalities. And finally, global organizations use financial sources, again, from other countries. The example will be, I don't know, any American corporation, IBM, or some other big corporation, like BMW, okay? When they need to borrow money, they can borrow from Germany. But it may be cheaper to borrow from Japan. It may be cheaper to borrow from London, okay? It may be cheaper to borrow from New York, okay? So, an international company will be trading goods and services with other countries, will employ managers from other countries, and will use financial sources, as in borrow from other countries. They may borrow from Hong Kong, for Hong Kong is a major financial center. Now financial center soon to be number two in Asia. Soon to be number one is, which one? Which is coming to be the biggest financial center in Asia? Which one? Shanghai, okay? Shanghai is becoming the biggest financial center in Asia. And number three going down is Tokyo. So Tokyo being number one is moving steadily to number two and is moving steadily to number three, being replaced by Shanghai and Hong Kong, okay? So that's what global organizations do. We also have a nice little term, Americans love it, global village. And a global village simply says that, oh, this is a world without boundaries. You move from one country to a second country to a third country. You can easily move with your goods. You can easily move with your services. I bring from my whole country my laptop, okay? I don't have to buy one here. I bring my iPod, I don't have to buy one here, okay? I bring my ebook reader, I don't have to buy here. So you can move around people and goods and services easily. You got easy transportation and the most important barrier to travel is visa. Now it's very easy to travel around in Asia, okay? For most countries, we don't need visa. For most countries, we need, we, we get what is called visa on arrival. Visa on arrival is you show up at the airport and they stamp your passport, okay? When I was teaching in Macau, I arrived in Hong Kong, okay? And they just give me a stamp, okay, no big deal. And from there, or I just get, get on the boat and go to Macau, they look, oh, you're from Europe, three months, come on in, okay, you're welcome. Uh, same thing in Thailand, for most Europeans, we get, I'm not sure, I think two months. No, visa on arrival is one month, okay? One month, come on in, no problem, okay, no questions asked. So, part of the global village is that most countries around the world are reducing visa requirements. This means it's very easy to travel. Airplanes, you can easily get on the airplane. You can make an international travel, okay? So it's a world without boundaries where goods, services, uh, 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 and that's not very good for the textbook. Goods, services, and people, very important, people. This is a big, you know, miss in the textbook. Goods, services, and people are produced and marketed around the world. So, goods and services, and people, we say travel. 
around the world. Okay, that's part of the global advantage. Next piece is multinational corporations. So multinational L corporation M N C. Okay, multinational corporation operates. We say is any kind of company is a business that operates in many countries, okay? So, it's got any sort of operation in many countries. The one example I gave you a few minutes ago was Nikon cameras, okay? Nikon is a Japanese company, right? But it has an operation here in Thailand, producing the zoom lenses and producing the body of some cameras. So oh, that's one example of a company. Here's another example. Your Apple iPads. When you open your Apple uh, look at the back, does it say made in USA? Where, where, where is your Apple made? What does it say? Made in? Huh? In China. Okay. Well, on my little iPod, I have an iPod, okay, not an iPad like you. Uh, I'm just watching videos on it. The iPod says, oh, oh, and I also have a MacBook. The MacBook says, designed in the USA, assembled in China. Okay? Well, designed in the USA, assembled in China. So, Apple maintains, maintains operations in the US and in China, and probably in a whole bunch of other countries, okay? So this is just another example of a multinational corporation. It has operations in multiple countries. The next one is called multi-domestic. Multi-domestic. So what's the difference between multinational and multi-domestic? In a multi-domestic, okay, it is a decentralized management and decisions are made in the local country. Okay, let's try to tell again the difference. In a multinational corporation like Nikon, Nikon, here not very many decisions are made, okay? Here is made the production. The locals will not choose the zoom lens, okay? The Japanese say 18 to 55, okay? They will provide the specifications, they will provide the technology, okay? They will provide whatever. In a multi-domestic, the local company is very independent. It makes its own decisions. An example of a multi-domestic operation could be, for example, a major hotel chain. In a major hotel chain, I, I don't know, I'm just making up the names, like Four Seasons Hotel, okay, you got it here, we've got it in Saudi Arabia, you got it almost everywhere in the world. In some countries, they will have centralized management. In other countries, it's going to be completely independent operation. Local managers run it, local managers do everything, okay? So in a multi-domestic corporation, in each country, you have management which makes its own decisions properly, okay? As long as they maintain the brand name, okay? Brand name. Of course, the Americans aren't going to allow design changes of the iPad or the iPod, okay? They're gonna keep the standard strict, okay? Finally, you have a global corporation, okay? Global corporation. It's again, a multinational corporation which centralizes management and other decisions in the home country. So, the difference is this decentralizes management and this centralizes management, okay? So, an MNC is just a general term. It is the term used for any company working in many countries. 
The one decentralizing is called multi-domestic. The one that's centralizing is called global corporation. The example of a very centralized company is BMW, okay? They're highly centralized. They have production in the United States, okay? They produce some BMWs in the United States. They produce BMWs, uh, I think, also in Mexico, okay? Uh, but they are highly centralized corporations. The other one I just gave you was Nikon, the cameras. Highly centralized corporations. All decisions are made at home in Japan. Okay. Let's see what else. And then you have a transnational borderless organization. This is more of a made up story by management. We say, oh, we got a structural arrangement for global companies that eliminates artificial geographical borders. What they essentially mean is that some companies and businesses like to operate as if they're not in any particular country. Why would they want to do that? The answer is some businesses structure and arrange in such a way so that they're not responsible to this government or not responsible to that government so that they do not fall under regulations here or do not fall under regulations there. So in a sense they eliminate artificial barriers by being a company in nowhere, in no particular country. They are company which are just they like to say, oh, we're everywhere, okay? And that's, uh, uh, that's one way, but in general, companies, businesses will be, we say, domiciled, meaning they are going to have a home in one particular country. All right. So how do organizations go global? How do organizations go global? First, Simple, easy step is you export. You export, okay? You go global by export. Another way is by import. You import some good, okay? And then you sell it at home, okay? So for your local company to go global is you import iPhones and then you sell them locally here, okay? So that's one way to go global. So one simple way is Aha, uh -huh. here's another simple way. You make a particular production here at home and you take a particular piece of equipment, a particular part, you take from abroad, you import. For example, you make your own little computer over here, but here in Thailand you don't produce computer chips, okay? The chip is produced in I want, okay? So, you will have your own little operation, but you bring in the chip from Taiwan. This is called sourcing. Sourcing means to use, in this particular case, another country as a source. So, you use another country to import a particular part particular part. In this particular case, it's going to be the memory chip or maybe the CPU. So simplest ways, you have your own local operation, but you import something from somewhere else. Okay? So global sourcing. You use only the part from abroad. On the next level, you will be doing some importing here or exporting. Okay. I was watching yesterday, this guy was doing a great job with the camera. He's zooming in, zooming out. We call this a learning process, okay? Learning process. He is slowly but steadily learning how to use the camera better and better, okay? By the end of this course, he's going to have a brand new skill. He's going to be doing 
video recording, so let's say that's going to be a new business for wild westerners who party like crazy over here, who's going to make videos for them and selling it for money, right? Or people get married, there's going to be a wedding video recorder, okay? So, importing and exporting is another way of growing your business, okay? You use a foreign good, you bring it in here, you sell it in the local market. Or, you produce a particular good in here, okay? And you export it to another country. That's very common. The next step is licensing and franchising. And in a franchise, the most popular franchise in the world today is McDonald's. In a McDonald's franchise, uh, any entrepreneur, any businessman who wants to open McDonald's uh, gets a franchise from the McDonald's headquarters in the United States. They pay the franchise fee. It's a one-time fee. Okay. And then probably they pay on an annual basis. And they open McDonald's, but they must operate. If they're going to use McDonald's brand name inside, everything in the franchise must be according to McDonald's standards. It's got to have the standard name in English and maybe the local language, right? English and Thai or English and Arabic in Bulgaria. English and Bulgarian language, okay? It's got to have the standard name, the standard size, the standard menu which you get. Probably localized for the local taste. So that's franchising. Licensing maybe, hey, uh, here's an example of a licensing. You go to the local mall, like Central, and you see the iStore, right? The iStore will be a store licensed by Apple to sell Apple, to sell Apple products, okay? And the licensing is a permit, but they have to follow Apple standards, okay? So it's very, very similar, okay? It's very similar. Or Apple can open its own store, okay? So Apple can just open its own store, or you can choose and say, hey, I'm gonna take a license and open an Apple store myself, but you need the license from the global corporation. So when you wanna go global, the corporation goes global, she will find a local person in that particular country, a local businessman, and that particular local businessman will open the store and do this for them, okay? So the company is not going to make a big investment in a franchise. Very, very, very little investment in a franchise, okay? You just let somebody else put the money. You give them permission. Same thing with the licensing. You let the local businessman do all the work. You just give them a license and then you go and check that they've done everything correct, okay? So the key here is, and I'm emphasizing the word investment, investment. In global sourcing, investment is minimum. Very little global, but very little investment to get the business going internationally. In franchising, the investment is also minimal. Not much, okay? In licensing, the investment is also minimal. You just let some local business do all the work, you give them a license, and you send somebody there to check that everything's okay. Now, if you need a much bigger, significant in global investment, you're going to do a joint venture. Joint venture means you take one international company, you take another international company, these two create a third company owned by the first two, 50-50, okay, or maybe 60-40, okay. 
The third new company is called a joint venture. So a joint venture is one company created by two or three companies, and the joint venture has particular purpose, particular business goal, particular operation, and so forth, okay? So two companies get together, they develop a new product, new service, and it goes both. Another type is, well, the general term is called strategic alliance. In a strategic alliance, you get one company joins together with another company and they try to do a work together, okay? Example will be a, some manufacturing company with some marketing and sales or retail company. A retail company is, you guys have here Carrefour? Or what, what, what big retail chain you have in here? Carrefour, uh, where they sell food or other retail stuff, okay? And you have a manufacturing company with a retail company. They get a strategic alliance where the retail company will be selling the products of that one. And another one is foreign subsidiary. The one foreign subsidiary which I see here, right next to Central, nearby, is Tesco, okay? Tesco is considered a British company, but technically, legally, it's actually a US company. And they have a subsidiary over here. They have an operation right over here, selling it to retailer, okay? So Tesco is a foreign subsidiary. All right, let's see what else we got. Managing a global corporation. Okay, so let me try and finish this section. We take the break for uh, this lecture. So you analyze differences by power distance, okay? How much Apple controls the local little Apple Pie store? How much Nikon controls the operation of the Nikon cameras over here? So very important is the distance. Are the owners far away or are they very close? The second major difference, and again, these are analyzing cultural differences, is depending on the type of organization. Is there individualism or collectivism? In some businesses, emphasis is on individualism. Individualism is emphasized in America, in UK, and in some European countries. Collectivism is emphasized heavily in Asia, like in Japan, very heavily uh, collectivism. Sometimes in Singapore, very heavily uh, emphasized. So you need to understand within the particular operation, within the particular culture, or within the particular business, whether people think in terms of collectivism or people think in terms of individualism, okay? Some cultures emphasize the one, others emphasize the other. Another important difference is with respect to life. Is there quality of life or quantity of life? Some cultures, some people, some businesses emphasize a lot more quantity over quality. Example of a culture which emphasizes quality of life is the French. French don't work as many hours, okay? Of course, they don't make as much money, okay? But the, yeah, they get very, very long vacation, like four weeks, sometimes five weeks, okay? They take an easy life. They go out to the restaurants, okay? Uh, they have good time, okay? So the French usually emphasize quality of life. Americans in American culture emphasizes quantity. How many TVs you're gonna have at home? How many iPods? How many iPads, okay? My brother's got one child, so husband, wife, and a child. They have like four computers at home, okay? Well, in Europe, we don't do these things, but 
She has been living in America for too long, okay? She's been living there for over 10 years. She's acquired American culture. He has acquired American mentality. And he is thinking more in terms of quantity. He is emphasizing having a big house, like 250 square meters, 300 square meters. You understand? 300 square meters. A huge house. Three floors with so many rooms for three people. Okay, not enough. Uh, uh, sorry, me. Too much, not needed. Okay. So some people emphasize quantity a lot. Others emphasize quality. And another very important part of uh, business, of people, of culture, of mentality is avoiding risk and avoiding uncertainty. Many cultures hate uncertainty. They want to play safe. They want to play sure. They don't want to risk part of the business. They don't want to risk making an investment in stocks or bonds. Many cultures, they don't want to risk making investment in something and Sometimes they don't want to make specific business risks. So you need to understand the particular culture of the people. When cultures and people try to avoid too much risk, they get into, in investments of particular trouble, real estate bubbles. Okay? Why they say, oh, I'm making a sure investment in real estate. Is real estate a very safe investment? Is it safe or not safe? Safe or not safe? Huh? I cannot hear. English, anyone? Safe or not safe? Real estate. Buying a house. Well, the answer is it depends on the price, okay? For a particular property, if you pay one million baht, it's probably a very safe investment. It's not going to fall a lot more. If you pay 50 million, okay, there is a lot more risk. So risk in real estate is associated with are you overpaying or you're paying too high price or you're taking or paying very little, okay? We say in finance, are you buying an overvalued or undervalued asset? But it's part of the culture. If people think, think incorrectly that real estate is safe, they drive the price too high. And when the price gets extremely high, they are taking huge risks. So some people, some cultures, it also depends on the difference between men and women. Men like to take a lot more risk. Women like to be take little risk. Women don't like to take a lot of risk, okay? Doesn't mean bad, doesn't mean good. We just say they're different, okay? So women usually avoid risk a lot more. Americans like to take a lot more risk. In other words, Anglo-Saxon culture, British, Americans, Australians, they like to take a lot of risk. Okay? And the last piece of analyzing a business is in analyzing culture, is in analyzing mentality, is long-term versus short-term orientation. 50, 70 hundred years ago, Americans were very, very, very long-term oriented. They look far into the future, okay? Today, today, American culture is called short-termist. They care about today. They care about tonight. They care about making the payment this month. Not caring too much what happens next month, okay? Or having too many problems to worry about next month and about next year. Example, example of a culture which is focused very long term is Japanese. 
Japanese don't think about next week or next month. They think 10 years in advance, 20 years in advance, 50 years in advance. Okay? The Japanese think very, very far ahead. Another culture thinking very far ahead in, uh, in time is Singapore thinking very hard. Now, another one which usually thinks far ahead in time will be Sweden. What about Finland? Is Finland usually a culture short-termist or far away? Finland? Finland? I can't hear. Maybe it's in between. Oh, maybe it's in between. So Finland, as our, your classmate says, is somewhere in between. What about Germany? Is Germany more long-term or short-term oriented? I would say more uh, long-term. Yes, I would definitely say Germans usually think a lot more long-term oriented. They usually do not want to sacrifice the long-term to get a little bit of a benefit in the short-term. So, working with Germans is usually very difficult if you think short term because they think long term. Now, if you think long term, usually it's very easy to work with Germans because they think the same way, okay? So, thinking short term means you're trying to get to quiz number one and you get a decent grade and that's it, okay? Thinking long term for you means you learn about management. You acquire good skills you get a good education, okay? So, it's up to you to see and decide which one you have. All right, this is good enough. We take a break, and after 10 minutes, we continue, okay? It's gonna be short.